Hey, welcome to the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Caleb Teske, and I got a great show for you today. Um, let's do the housekeeping off the top. Um, we've had a bunch of really killer shows recently. Um, if you guys didn't catch my show with um, Jenny Argy over in New York, um, who's uh, in the middle of this lawsuit against the state for uh, what she describes as a selective enforcement against her manufacturing company, um, I had a great show with Leo Stone from Aficionado, um, Carl Giannone from Trade Roots down in Massachusetts, uh, Travis Cesaroni, who's mapping out some crazy spheres of influence here. He's going to be coming back on the show soon. Uh, Dr. Chris Hudala down at Pro Verde Labs in Massachusetts. Um, and I got some some great shows coming up tomorrow. I got Pilar De Jesus, um, who's in Brooklyn, I think, um, or Harlem, somewhere in the city, um, who used to work with the National Expungement Week. Um, did a lot of advocacy stuff. Super excited to have her on. Um, next week, I got uh, Doc Ray, who's a Special Forces veteran out in California, who's just coming off some um, NDAs. Um, so I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but that's going to be a heater, too. Uh, and then coming up, I got Jamie Toth, who just um, released some excellent randomized data about some uh, sketchy lab stuff going on in Michigan. And then April 25th, I got Luke Carlin, LMC Media. If you guys haven't checked out Luke's work, he's pulling some big, big interviews. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Um, today, my guest is someone who's appeared on the show before, uh, back in the, oh boy, it must have been a year and a half ago at least. Um, she was working with the clean cannabis company um, and I had the three of them on and now she's going to join me solo. Please welcome Katie Tilton to the show. Katie, thanks for being here today. Thank you. I have to say, I love your intro to the show. That whole video is like incredible. Thank you. <laughs> um, that video is done by my man, Rodney Leinhart. Uh, thank you, Rodney. He's also been on the show and the music was provided by Eric McEdward, AKA Rico James. Thank you guys both for that. Um, would you give us, and I feel like we might've done this on the last one, but just for posterity real quick, would you give us a, a five minute life story? Sure. Um, I'm born and raised in Vermont. Pretty simple. Uh, I've done a lot of traveling. Most of my work is like part-time seasonal things just to fill the gaps between my newest travels. But, uh, I, I have a little bit of experience growing. I have a lot of experience caretaking. I mean, I did a lot of work with elderly care and working at preschools and all sorts of caretaking. I really like a lot of gardening experience. Um, and then, yeah, cannabis the last few years, I did some work in the legacy market and then some work in the legal market, which that kind of consumed the last few years of my life and I found that direction I really enjoy. Um, still doing a bunch of traveling and just filling in the gaps with random things here and there in my life. I keep really busy. I've got a dog that keeps me on my toes. We do all sorts of adventures and we track together and we fish together. And that's kind of just me, a little all over the place, a little hot mess, but <laughs> um, keeping it together and just taking life every day and trying to enjoy it every day. And uh, skinning coyotes with my girlfriend, I see. Absolutely. I hope you saw the pictures because I was quite impressed with that woman. <laughs> she had a blast. <laughs> um, cool. So let's dive in here and hold up. I'm going to put you in the big box for the rest of this. There we go. Oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, so let's dive in. I'd like to start um, from the beginning here and ask you how you guys sort of all came together, like how you met Devin and Derek. Okay. Um, I didn't know Devin and Derek at all, actually. It was a family friend that actually owns the gravel pit there where their building is, and they kind of connected some dots like, oh, this girl might be a good fit, and I had an interview with them it was like November 21 and they presented this grand idea, which seemed like out of the world. I mean, state of the art tier three indoor hydroponic facility. I I'm like, I don't know you guys like that's above what I do. And they're like, no, no, like we were looking for that. So you'd be a great fit and kind of hired me on the spot. I mean, 
we got a contract signed. I've from there, I've helped actually construct the building because they had just laid like the groundwork on the structure itself. So I started in early. I did some trainings with one of their consultants and helped with the construction. We set up all the rooms together and then we got our founder tattoos when we were ready to finally start plants. And that was like March. So it came together really quickly with the group of people there. It really took off. And that's kind of how I got to know Devin and Derek both. We spent a lot of hours together and really got to learn a lot about each other in that time. And how do those two know each other? Devin and Derek are ex-brother-in-laws um and yeah i mean not really my story to tell but derek was married to devin's sister ah. yeah who came back in the picture for the business part of things but essentially i think i took a role that maybe she was anticipated to fill early on when there was talk of the business may be starting, but yeah, tight, mm -hmm. tight knit family stuff there. Okay. And here's chef Rodney peace. Rodney, thanks for tuning in as always. And here's James Lang. Hey, nice. Uh, James also, thank you for tuning in, man. Um, I would like to ask you also, what were their roles? You were obviously the lead grower. What roles were Devin and Derek serving in when you guys started this business? There were a lot of blurred lines. I mean, everyone played. I mean, we were a master of all trades at that point starting. Um, from my standpoint, I would say Devin was more of the business and social piece, um, financing, HR. I mean, every position that needed to be filled. Derek and I worked closely, like managing plants and then Derek working, like expanding the processing room and all stuff like that. So he kind of transitioned a bit, but in the beginning it was all, we, we balanced a lot of things and figured things out as a team. And what was their experience level when it comes to growing cannabis? From my understanding, home grow, like small scale, home grow Derek shared I mean he had a nice little setup in his house but maybe a couple plants I think Devin the same um Devin was pretty new to cannabis I know it was something that he steered clear of for a while and kind of got into it when the market kind of started to take off but yeah I mean Derek's a fan. <laughs> he's he got knowledge and education in that piece. I mean, he takes pride in what he learns and really tries to apply things. Oh, so now when I first met you guys, I feel like it must have been almost two years ago. Um, I came yeah. through, I got the tour, we did the interview a few months later. Uh, during your time, how long did you work there, would you say, ballpark? That I did the interview with you? No, how long did you work um, for the clean cannabis company? Um, about a year and a half. And so during your time there, did you see anything that was out of whack? What were some of your observations while you were there? Who? I mean, it was like a shit show of a circus. I mean, none of us had any true experience. I mean... For me, being a grower, taking on a large scale hydroponics, I had no idea. And I mean, we we had a lot of learning curves and learned through our mistakes and their costly mistakes. So there were things that were happening that I just didn't even feel comfortable. Like this isn't the best we can do, but we have to get product out and money in the door to just stay above water. And a lot of things kind of got pushed back and forth between people's roles. I didn't feel like as a grower, I had a lot of say in what was happening. It was more, this actually has to be done. We don't have time to 
figure out this mold issue because we need plants in the room today. So just crank it out. We got to do it. And it, it was more of like a, they're definitely business men I learned. And I, I take more pride in the plant itself and really caring for something and watching it grow and do the best I can do and make a quality product. Uh, so you said there was a mold issue. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would. The mold, we had a lot of issues with, I mean, ventilation. All winter long, we were having like the AC units freeze up outside and what was anticipated to be a really controlled indoor facility there we had no control really i mean we were getting filters clogged up with calcium and we were acs weren't working lights were like not dialed in water wasn't dialed in um the mold issue kind of really took off like that last crop i was there we were having mold in some of the on the moms and like moving moms to the veg and then contaminating those plants and then plants into the flower room. And, you know, mine were, my logic is if there's mold, we got to get rid of it. I mean, needs to be out of the room. There's no saving the plant, but we were actually just cutting moldy buds off the plants and trying to still get our, maximum amount of product out the doors um yet it kind of got out of control for a while and that last crop when i was there 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 were some big cleaning procedures that needed to take place and essentially starting from ground zero again i mean starting new seeds and those weren't really steps that they were interested in taking it was more about the mass production and getting things out the door so i didn't feel good about having my name associated with products that weren't quality like our image was supposed to be. And so you brought these concerns to, to Derek and Devin and told them about it? Yeah, um, there was a bunch of good literature, like even Devin and Derek had the books on their shelves, like this is what needs to happen when this happens in the room. And they kind of tried cutting corners. They're, I'm not about spraying plants and flower. Like, I don't feel good about that. I think that it's really dangerous at certain points of the plant's life. Like, when you're going to smoke that flower, you shouldn't put anything on it. And they'd go in with, like, their backpack sprayers and try to treat things, like, week before harvest. Like, plants are already mold. Like, we got bigger problems. And anything to, like, save a dollar and... The bigger picture, I mean, quality and really just taking pride in like doing things the right way. But there are a lot of procedures that just didn't really get met. Every crop, um, I mean, like we were wearing scrubs, we weren't wearing gloves, we weren't wearing hair nets, but sometimes um, just not a lot of consistency. Granted, it was early on. I mean, still dialing in everything myself. I was dialing in the watering systems, the light systems, but a lot of things that were just going overlooked that created bigger problems for everyone in the end. And, and now, what are we spraying during flowering? Because I, you know, I know most growers don't also don't like to spray anything during flower, but what exactly was being sprayed? I'm trying, I tried looking at pictures online of what it was, but something from one of their home grows that said on it all natural on the front. Um, but it's called a fungicide. So I don't even know regulations with the state, like what you can legally spray. Um, but my practice, I, I won't spray my plants and flower. There's other ways that I would approach things. But I mean, in an indoor facility, they they were kind of a little more limited that they felt. Um, but yeah, we had some backpack sprayers with, I don't know the name of it. It's something we hid in our um, state-of-the-art gym when licensing would come though. So at that point, I'm like, must be bad if I'm being asked to hide it in our gym. <laughs> 
Okay, here's here's woke shaman too. Yeah, I don't know who this is, but they like to tune in every now and then. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> um, now you also sent me some pictures, Katie, of um, uh, being up on a a ladder, which looked kind of sketchy. Like you had a ladder up on the sliding tables where you had to get up there and and clean. Is that what I was looking at? Yeah. So the calcium issue building up in the AC units. Um, it was never really addressed to find a solution. The solution was we just have to clean them every day. So mind you in a room packed full of plants on sliding tables that you can barely walk through, I'm having to climb up a 12 foot ladder on top of a table to get to each head unit. There's four in each room um, just to like take the filters out and clean them every day, just so our AC would work in the room. Every day. every day, if you didn't do it every day, we would have like too high of temperatures the next day. Um, our plants were really stressed. I try to do it as much as I could because the heat stressed them out. I mean, we were having seeds in our crops of feminine plants. I mean, like, they got really stressed out and it stressed me out, but also that was an issue that just wasn't really solved, but we had like a little band aid we could apply every day. We'll just spray them out. You'd think that would be something that would be prioritized. I don't know. I would imagine if, if that was going on in my facility, I would want to address that immediately. I'm wondering, I would too. Um, if the calcium was getting through the water, I wonder about like their water source then. I mean, they're really close to the metals recycling and dump there. Like, I think it's really important to know what's in your water and there should be a way to filter out calcium. I'm not an expert, but I feel like there's things that can be done. I mean, we would have powder of calcium on the plants every day from just the AC units blowing. And it and sounds like that was leading to some issues with temperature control as well. Yeah, um, our head units were usually overnight, like they'd be overheating. And by morning, I mean, sometimes it was as bad as like tripping the breakers and the power outage. And we're suddenly opening the doors to outside to let all the heat out. Um, but yeah, that played a really big role. And just trying to maintain a good temperature. And then the lights are so intense, like those yeah, magnetic yeah. lights, like they're hot. So I saw them. I, I actually stood in that room when they turned them on and I thought I almost went blind for a second. Yeah. Hmm. But, I want to yeah. read a couple comments here. This is from James Lang again. Yeah, the first runs from Clean Were Week, 14% Blue Dream that I recall. Would love to hear about Steezy and Louis Guzman. James, I think that's going to be... Um, another show but i'd be happy to talk about that another time <clears throat> here's um woke shaman again hide that fungicide the ccb coming um, <laughs> here, and here's sydney basha saying yeah that's sketchy i think that was in relation to maybe you having to climb on those ladders um and woke shaman here here's an interesting one um tell us about your role designing and your role selecting i assume you're talking about maybe genetics but uh Got any comments on that, Katie? As far as genetics, um, the boys both had a couple of strains that they were really set on. They were, I mean, the Santa Morta and Los Pepes were pretty sure one of the guys we just met at one of the networking events that had like these seeds he was trying to sell. And I personally loved the strains. Like that Santa Morta is one of my favorite strains. Um, I personally, again, like, didn't have much say in a lot of that stuff. I know it was in the contract that my role was lead grower and kind of running everything. But as far as any real decision making, I had a decision like designing the viewing windows and naming the rooms. But <laughs> I painted the walls, glitter paint. <laughs> Those were the, de the decisions I was able to make. Otherwise, it was kind of out of my control at that point and here we go also you did so much for marketing i loved seeing your stories um i felt like you were the main reason they got followers 
I can't even watch their social media sucks since you left. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to your point, um, to your point also, um, where's the other one? Um, the Hardwick water table is fucked. They're right downstream from all metals. And yeah, that is something I've also uh, been looking at. And I know it seemed like they had a pretty sophisticated um, RO system, if I'm not mistaken. They did Shit. not have an RO. Oh, okay. Um, there was talk about it. I don't know the decision to not get one probably cost, but they didn't end up going the RO route. And here's Sydney again. Someone should share this with Luis Guzman. Uh, yeah, Louis, I don't know how you say it. Uh, <laughs> cool. So, uh, now that we've got most of that stuff, um, oh, there was a couple other ones in that vein when you said, uh, maybe, at one point, maybe this was like your first run where they asked you to switch nutrients in the middle of a run. Yeah. So we were running powder nutrients, our very first crop. Um, our first crop was actually CBD that we had to burn at the end. We didn't have like a CBD license to grow, but um, that was kind of a trial to see how that would work on our THC plants. And everything seemed to be fine. I mean, a little more labor intensive because you're mixing nutrients every day in big reservoirs and just a little more measuring and making sure you have your calculations right. Um, we didn't have too, too many problems with that. Um, I mean, got things dialed in. We found out like, oh, we need to have something in here, like keeping the water moving and keeping it agitated. So there's nothing, nothing's building up. But I found that once we switch to the liquid nutrients halfway through this crop, mind you, as you said, uh, we were getting so much buildup in the lines, which makes it again another struggle when you have drip emitters and your plants are like solely surviving off the water in a hydro facility and plants aren't getting water because the nutrients is clogging up your lines. So that switch was made halfway through the crop. Um, it wasn't really a fair judge to see what that really did in effect because it was our first time growing the strains. It was our, our first time around, but yeah, that was a big change up. And then even then we still weren't dialed in with liquid nutrients by the time I left. So there are so many problems that came with that. How do you how do you fix that if your lines are getting jammed up with this? Uh, is there a, a remedy for that? What, what does that look like? I think there's many solutions. And in the moment when your plants aren't getting water and they need water, like you go to a survival mode of like, we got to individually pull apart all these emitters and like clean them. We had scrub brushes. We were like clipping the emitters so it didn't have to travel through so much of the end piece to drip. Um, we would run, I'm not sure what we were running through the lines, but we would like take the emitters out of the plants and set them on the table and just run like a cleaning solution through the, what was that nutrient we were using? Uh, I can't remember. They had like a cleaning agent that supposedly was also safe. So middle of a plant cycle again we're running cleaner through the lines and then sticking them back in the plants after that but uh yeah that was a big big hassle the emitters gave us a lot of issues mm, here's no, no real solution. <laughs> oh my god that's so funny a, a million dollar facility growing cbd then burning it i guess they can't claim legacy and to be fair you know they never did uh woke shaman um you know, they uh, Devin admitted to me that he's not a big legacy guy, so I don't want to give the impression that he was ever claiming that either. Um, but yeah, it's also it's a, I think it's a three or four million dollar facility. Um, <laughs> oh, so. that's when I was there. I think it's went up since then. They've got their new uh, bottling room in there, or whatever they have going on. Saw that, uh, which was interesting because it sounded like they didn't have a ton of money but that looked expensive um anyway we'll get there um so let's see that's about all the issues i had from when you were working there and by the way everyone that's listening i'm here with katie tilton she's the former uh, lead grower from clean cannabis company in hardwick 
Um, so, Katie, let's talk about now um, what happened after when you went on vacation and in between the time when you came back. Um, and then we'll get to the, the stuff after that. Okay. Um, it's kind of a long story, and I'll try to make it short. No, uh, make it long. <laughs> we had agreements early on with, I mean, when I got hired, I, I had a different understanding and agreement than they kind of had. Um, I was under the impression I would have time off. I was under the impression I would have more of a schedule. Um, there are a lot of things that kind of changed over my course working there. Um, and this one year mark was like a big day for me because I'm like, oh, we talked about a company vehicle. We talked about getting crop share. We talked about like a big pay raise. And at that point, like I, I know the year mark's approaching and I'm trying to get things figured out because I'm ready for my, like my trip. I'm ready to take a little vacation of some sort. And I kind of put it in their ears and it was kind of immediately shut down. Like, oh, there's no way anyone's leaving. Like we have plans to grow. And I thought we'd have employees at this point. Like, and I was going to hire the employees and they could hold down the fort for a week when I'm gone. Um, so we kind of transitioned into that. And instead of hiring people that we really knew or like had experience, we we're just picking people off the street. We got people knocking on the door. No one knows them, but it's like, come on in. We're looking for workers. And so no one really fell into the category of someone capable to run the operation. I was gone. We were putting at them in different, different jobs, like processing and cleaning. Um, we did have one guy, Tyler, who was like incredible. Like I, I would trust him with any grow. Uh, but he kind of was seeing the bullshit at the same time as me. Like, I don't know if we want to be here. Like this, this isn't good practice. Uh, so we had things lined up. I straight up told him like, I'm taking a trip and Devin's like, well, your year marks come and when, like you've been here way over a year. We just, and I'm like, oh, you just haven't acknowledged that or held up your end of the deal. Like, so with that said, I'm taking a trip. I'm going to get a raise and let's talk about what kind of vehicle. Let's talk about all these things that were promised to me a year ago that made me stay. Not in writing, which I'm learning now. Get that shit in writing. <laughs> um, but yeah, they were frantic at this point. Like, oh, she's she's going to leave and she wants all these demands. And are they demands? I was told they would happen after a year. This is like a year and a few months. Um, so yeah, I just kind of booked a trip. At this point, I had started dating Chandler and he's in Colorado and I'm convincing him like I got a sweet gig here like you should come to Vermont he's like come to Colorado I got a good gig here so I'm like I gotta at least feel it out I went to Colorado and Devin and Derek are having conversations before I left Devin's like don't sweat it when you come back you're gonna have a job and we're gonna figure it out if it means giving you the raise I just gave myself, if it means me selling my $100,000 truck, I will do that so you will stay. Like, we're going to make things right. We just don't have, like, income yet. And Well, don't have income, but you, <laughs> said, you just said that he gave himself a raise? Oh, he can spend money. It's not his. Like, maybe I would, too, if I was in that position unlimited got, amount of money and just spend it and give yourself raises Fuck and yeah. you mentioned you mentioned the thing about the company vehicle um did he buy himself a vehicle no we had he had the vehicle before there was a building with the company oh. money he bought that big truck um i think the intention was for plowing and like advertising but you can't have decals on a vehicle that you're dropping off product. So that fell through and it seemed like Derek was doing more of the plowing with his own personal vehicle. Cause like who buys a brand new truck to throw a plow on it? And like, 
beat the shit out of it really like <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the truck kind of had no, no use to the company at all, but Devin had a brand new truck that he could drive back and forth to work. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you tell us about the crop sharing deal or what that was supposed to look like? Yeah. When I first started with my understanding from legacy market, I kind of knew I was setting the bar high, like. I know what, what I can get here. Like I know what to expect. So we agreed on a 25% crop share after a year and I was still going to get my salary pay, but the salary was supposed to go up and that didn't either. And you, um, so you didn't get any of the crop share? No, we sold a couple. Yeah. Like a couple of strains while we were there, they were making sales, but they didn't have the money to help me out at all, like not even a pay raise. So when I was on this trip, I'm kind of thinking, okay, like I'm going to stay with them, but like it can't be the way things are. Like at my salary rate and the hours I'm putting in, I'm making less than their hourly employees. Like I'll be an hourly employee. Like there's my solution. So I presented that. And they offered for Chandler to come on to do media stuff. So they offered me an hourly position at like $40 an hour. Like Devin was desperate. He was promising like $40 an hour, three days a week, you and Chandler, um, we need you here. So I get to Colorado. I'm like, fuck yeah, Chandler. Like we have jobs. Come to Vermont with me. So we uprooted his life packed and back. We were less than 24 hours away from Vermont, anticipating going to work the next day. And not Evan, but Derek calls me to break the news like, oh, well, even though Devin made all those promises, we can't, we can't do anything different. Come back under the same circumstances. Chandler doesn't have a job, though. You can still be salary and work your 60 hours a week or whatever it was that week, but just no negotiation at all. I'd like to post a couple of comments here um, real quick. There's James Lang money. Yeah, no way there. Cash flow positive. And here's a question for you, Katie. Um, this was about the profit share. He said 25% of what profit? Please explain more crop share. Do you know um, the details there? I, I don't. What we talked about crop share is any of the flour that was sold, the, price that we were selling it to the dispensaries, I was going to get 25% of whatever was left of that. I mean, there's taxes and things that come out or whatever that was, 25% of what we were getting back is what I was told I would get. And between three people, I mean, it, it was agreed upon, it was doable and just never happened. Mm. Okay. And, you know, it did seem like there was a little bit of, um, discrepancy in the conversations about whether or not Chandler was offered a job. And I believe the quote from Devin was like, would you hire someone you've only known for five months? Um, but it sounds like they hired you and didn't really know you for that long either. Oh, they hired me on the spot. They hired Will on the spot. I mean, he knocked on the door. He wasn't even living in Vermont that long. And saw a big sign go up and figured he'd take his chances. I mean, a lot of the people employed there while I was there, Tyler, no one really knew Tyler, but he got a job right away. But Chandler, no, I've only known him five minutes. I'm, I wouldn't offer him a job. Like that's kind of a little contradicting considering I got hired within five minutes of knowing these people. And it sounds like if I recall from our conversation that if if this job was not on the table for you, that you were going to stay out west with him. Is that yeah, accurate? absolutely. But they I mean, Devin offered me again his pay raise that he just gave himself and he would sell the truck to make sure I got what I needed to stay. So I came back like that's all I was asking for from day one. And it was going to happen. And. I felt good about staying. I love plants. I love doing that. And and then also, 
something I found noteworthy was that he had Derek call you instead of calling you himself and maybe he wasn't even willing to speak with you at all. Is that accurate as well? Yeah. So the last conversation I had with Devin was the agreement we had with me and Chandler having like these new positions for us. That was the last conversation I've had with Devin to this day. I mean, even when I went to pick up my things, he, it was a scheduled time where Devin was in a meeting and running down to the end of the building before I can even, hey, Devin, like, what's up? Not even an, op an opportunity there. Mm. Now, the rest of this is going to be a little disjointed because my notes are sometimes all over the place. Um, you sent me a lot of shit. Um, but there was something else about a proposal for you to sign on to the insurance plan. I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so Devin really wanted to hire his wife, um, which he did before we really had any sales. She was our accountant. Um, but she couldn't leave her job until Clean Cannabis could offer insurance because she was the carrier of insurance for their family. Um, but to get this plan, they needed to have like four people signed on. So he was asking me, Derek himself and his wife would be the fourth and we would all be able to carry this incredibly expensive insurance that like, I'm like, Derek, you buying into this? Like you got a pretty good deal as it is. Like, I know I got a good deal as it is. Like, I'm not buying that. <laughs> Um, I got a couple of comments here. I am Green Giant. First time here, guys. Hey, man, thanks for watching. And we got Ben Wilcox here. Um, contrary to popular belief, there's just not that much money to be made growing weed. If you're smart and you keep your costs low, you can make a living. But getting rich quick is a pipe dream. And thanks for Ben. Um, also takes several months at a minimum before you even see a penny of revenue. It takes me a year usually. Um, and Ben, thank you also for, for tuning in, man. I don't get a lot of comments from Ben on the show. All right, man. Thank you. Um, where were we at? Um, yeah, so I, um, <clears throat> you also said that um, at one point you were told uh, you were in charge of the cultivation, but you're told you couldn't hire anyone um, that you were attracted to. Is that correct? Specifically, like any males like were like not even an option if there's someone that's a good grower but they're a male we're not gonna hire them because kate's single and if they spark up a relationship then we're gonna be out like two people if they want to travel for the weekend or do something and which is interesting because they've got devin's wife and sister slash derek's ex-wife now working there and all sorts of friends and family Hmm. Um, another question from James here. You were going to get 25% crop share with no investment in the company? Supposedly. Devin, too. I mean. And that was, in the, that was in the contract, right? I read the contract and there was something in there, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I think it talked of crop share, but there were no specifics in the no numbers. In the yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good question, James. Um, and to your point earlier, you know, to anyone who's listening out there, get that shit in writing because you just never know. Um, and, you know, so, boy, and here's James again. Love you, Ben. Um, yeah, cool. You guys, I'll get you guys a private room if you need. Uh, <laughs> um, can I ask you, uh, what is grounding? You tell me. I, I have to Google it. This was an idea of, De of Devin's. He, he's all about how they're going to promote the product. And instead of just simply like we're a state-of-the-art tier three hydroponic facility, it's like we're going to do celebrity branding. We're going to say we're women run. We're going to do all, all these things. We're clean. We're quality. This grounding was a new one. Like, oh, this will make us stick out from everyone else. We're going to put copper grounding rods in each of the plants to simulate like them being outside and having like the electronic frequencies from the ground help them grow. And like the investment in this idea was 
outrageous. Like, whoa, we're out of nutrients, you guys. Like, we can't buy nutrients right now, but we're we're talking about grounding rods for each plant in the facility. So I don't know if you're about that kind of energy, fucking grow outdoor. Like what a great way to get that for free, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'd never heard of that either. And I had to also look it up and what I read seemed kind of like hocus pocus. <clears throat> um, boy, let's see what else we got. Um, there was a couple other questions that I should have asked earlier that I'm going to swing back to here. Um, have you ever seen uh, trim or shake going into pre-rolls? Trim and shake was all that we were putting in pre-rolls when I was there. Our quality pre-rolls, like they were called premium pre-rolls and it was trim and shake. Hmm. And you know, some of those I saw selling for as much as 18, 17, $18 at dispensaries. Yeah. I kind of chuckle at their prices everywhere. Cause I feel like they're ranked this like highest tier, but I've got people knowing that I'm associated with clean cannabis. Like, I don't even want to say this, but I'm finding like seeds. Like I got moldy weed. I just picked up like, what the fuck? Mm. But yeah. Here's <laughs> here's, ben, here's ben again everyone knows you can't grow weed outside in vermont Make your face. ben grows some great herb too uh here's todd to massey another guy i've been talking to grounding how about you ground your freaking lamps guys because them guys got some wires loose for sure <laughs> thanks thanks for watching um todd uh here's another question i had um it, how is it that um, they didn't have money to get you a vehicle or get you your pay raise that you were offered, but suddenly had the money to hire 12 other people. Well, you had the interview with them. I would love to know that too, Caleb. <laughs> I have no idea. Like, I'm baffled. I've, I'm insulted, offended. Like, I think that's so shady and have me be pushed out of a company that, I fucking put my blood, sweat, and tears in too, just so they can spend all this extra money and not hold up the one and only deal that we had. I mean, it's really insulting. Mm. And so some of the other stuff that um, I think I might have noticed at one point, but you said, you know, this photographer that they hired was hired maybe at the same pay rate as you, who is their cultivation lead. And also was like taking pictures of things where you were just like, do not fucking show that to anybody. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, the pay scale, I mean, you can do your own math, but I was on salary. I had a set pay for the year and I unlimited hours. There wasn't a week that I worked 40 hours a week. It was always more. And then you've got hourly people coming in at 25 bucks. And it's like, they're walking out with bigger pockets than me at the end of the day, like bragging about how they just took a five minute shower and made like, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you people like, but yeah, the, the media in the beginning, I know that early on Devin had a friend that he already promised a job to, and we still talk that we don't have the funds, but we hired someone to do the marketing and a lot of the stuff, like if you don't know cannabis and what you're looking for, you don't know what to present. You don't, Devin himself would walk into a room and look at like mold and be like, Oh, look at this. Like Keith, look how, like, look at these crystals. Like, Oh my God, Devin, like you just found mold. What are you talking about? And a lot of the people that were being hired when I was there also just like, what's a cannabis plant look like? Like, what do you mean? Like cut this branch off? Like, I don't know. I've never seen it before. I don't know how it grows. I don't know what it looks like. So some of the advertising was just, I mean, things I'm like, oh my gosh, take it off. Like, take it down. Like yellow leaves. Why are you posting yellow leaves and saying like, look at these fire colors. Like, mm. that's a deficiency, you guys. <laughs> it, 
here we go too. Here's here's Chef Rodney who did my intro video. That this all sounds well beyond fuck. Just more bros pretending that they can run shit when in reality they still can't find the G spot. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and you said at one point and you were on salary which um uh i fucking hate being on sal i've never been on salary thank god but you said at one point you were working so many hours that it basically boiled down to you were making like 10 bucks an hour yeah we would i would say they're overnight with them like i we were doing crazy things like early on to like building the facility, we would stay there and paint all night long and morning would come up, get breakfast and start our day again. Mm. Like and, and hanging up. <laughs> <laughs> um, what uh, you also mentioned that maybe you're being asked to train the new hires that they were bringing on. Yeah. Um, that was challenging. Cause we had all these other issues with the heat and the watering and, but now it turned into my job to train people again that have never seen a cannabis plant. They've never looked at a nug, like just we're here because our family member works here type thing. Um, and it, it's just impossible to do when you're also running the show of growing. I mean, tier three I was doing by myself at this point, but also babysitting the people in the other room, making sure like giving them a job that they're capable of doing without a lot of guts, like even cutting clones. It's like, I can't watch over someone's shoulder and run this facility at the same time. So finding even just little tasks that were doable and something you could trust somebody like can't fuck up too bad doing this like was like a bigger challenge of my day than trying to juggle like the shit show circus i was in on my own <laughs> did you ever see moldy product going out the door to dispensaries i mean myself i haven't seen what goes out the door i mean processing was something i helped in maybe like rarely if needed. Um, but from seeing what's in the grow room and seeing what I'm being asked to hang and dry and cure for processing hundred percent moldy products going out the door. I mean, we weren't throwing any plants away. We were cutting off buds that had mold and throwing them in a bag for fresh frozen. Like no plant went to waste there. Um, okay. I'm, and, uh, oh, there was this other thing about maybe dumping nutrient water. Yeah, we had like a spiel when people asked about our like wastewater runoff, what we do with it. And supposedly enough of the water evaporates that it turns into a solid that we can get rid of, like a small solid chunk. But I've never seen this. I mean, we were dumping nutrient water on the ground we were having water problems every day and just running shit like right in floor drains so just dumping it in the ground our floor drains that i'm pretty sure were like gravity whatever the like a mound system or something outside but it yeah into the ground hmm. all right so i think i'm getting towards the end of my shit here let me just breeze through um here we go let me i got one more comment here that's what woke shaman that's what i hate most about this industry is careless karens and chads riding the coattails of people that know what they're doing um certainly i've seen a lot of that in, in a lot of the bigger companies um yeah fakes fakes and snakes yeah <laughs> word up um i want to ask you before we get out of here um is there anything we missed that you'd like to talk about? Um, I don't know. Like, I could be this babbling brat and just go into so many things how they just wronged me. But I think at the end of the day, it was hard for me having 
friends approach me like, hey, I know you grow for clean cannabis. I brought the bought the product and I'm like, oh, I'm actually not there anymore. Great, because I found mold or I found seeds. Like that was my biggest fear is having my name associated with not the quality product that we were representing. And I mean, in the beginning, I, I wouldn't have put any of that stuff out on the market. If it was my business, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't spend the money the way that it's being spent. Um, I mean, the first day I met Devin, like he's like, I'm going to get rich in five years and retire. And then he's like, I'm going to sell the building to you. I'm like, I don't fucking want that. Like, huh. <laughs> um, but yeah. He said it best. They're one big happy family at Clean Cannabis. I mean, he also literally. said <laughs> he also said that um, you are family, and I was curious how you feel now that you guys have um, separated. You know, like what are your thoughts on your time there? Aside from all this other shit, but like, what are your feelings about how that played out? Um, I did always get that like your family, like both the boys have cried in front of me confided in me like we had a real like pretty intimate working relationship i mean we knew a lot about each other and i don't know like i stand true to that like they were my family and when i was pushed out of there like driven away like i really thought that derek absolutely i'm like Derek's my homie. There's going to be a cool concert coming up and he's going to call me and be like, Wu Tang playing, like, get your fucking dancing shoes on. And I saw you there. Yeah. <laughs> but completely now it's just like, I haven't soaked to Derek since. I've called him, I've texted him, I've tried to just be a friend like I thought we were in the beginning. But it's hard when you're being manipulated by someone that's really controlling your life. And I think that person is Devin for him. And it's, it's sad. Like Devin's not family to me in his interview with you. He had to ask how to find a message for someone that you've blocked. So is that really leaving like an open door to like communicate if you block somebody? You never found that either, by the way. <laughs> Cause there wasn't one. <laughs> There also isn't a, any message of me saying like, I quit, I'm done. Like, well, that was the other thing that was odd. Like when I asked him how you parted ways, if you got fired or quit, seemed like he didn't really want to say one way or the other. Right. Well, Trevor had a lot to say on that because he knows me so well. <laughs> but, uh, if Derek, if Derek and Devin are listening, it was fucking weird that you invite. And I like Trevor, but that was fucking weird that you invited him to that meeting. He had nothing to do with anything, and he shouldn't have been in there, in my opinion. A yeah. um, couple, couple questions for you, Katie, if you don't mind. Sure. I don't know if you know the answers, but Dave Anderson here. What's the role of Louis Guzman with the company, and where did the investment money for the company come from? Um, Louis Guzman is new since I've been out of there. So I, I don't know the role. I mean, they were trying to get big poppy to do some marketing and branding with them. So it's, they were seeking somebody. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's a local Vermonter. I know from the beginning, Devin was reaching out to like the governor and wanted the governor to do like a ribbon cutting at the facility and the governor who hates weed. <laughs> And I know Louie was on his radar. He's like, oh, he lives locally. Like, maybe I can figure out how to get a hold of his daughter and then get a hold of him. And that was all kind of weird. But um, Derek's family has the money that's been funding the company. I mean, from the sound of how it keeps coming, like, there's really no end to it. Um, his mom pretty much said if the company fails, she'll buy she'll buy the building back and find use for it. Um, I know they want to like have a big facility in the Bahamas where his mom is like, so money is really no object, but it's definitely Derek's family that's investing everything. Cause I don't think they have anything to lose at the end of the day. 
Uh, another question from Todd here. Todd says, so frustrating. How are they able to pass all their tests for mold and pathogens? Any idea? Did they submit someone else's product? That I'm not really sure. And I was wondering when they're like when Trevor started working there, I didn't know if he was maybe testing stuff. So I don't know how that works, but I don't even think that where we were sending our products to is doing our the testing anymore. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but obviously you pick through and find like your best nug. Like I'm sure everyone does it. You find your most quality nug and send that. And some you could tell there's mold, but some you don't know. I don't know what how much mold can legally be in a plant, but it must be a pretty, pretty large amount that they're letting slide because it's it's on the shelves at the stores. So, um, and here's Woke Shaman talking about Louis Guzman. He made the get nice pre rolls. I think those are little blunts or something. And he was a comedian, MC and comedian at the party in Stowe at Alfie's. Hey, if you guys need a real comedian, you could call me. I actually. <laughs> Um, here's Rodney again too. Um, these people sound like children. Anytime a company says your family, take that as a sign and run. Families and companies are always toxic. Employers use this as a disarming tool to manipulate. And it worked. Mm. And here's Todd again. Fuck the narcissistic Chads and Brads. Uh, word up, Todd. Uh, let's see if we got anyone else. Um, Scott Scott Hansen said, "Did you ever get the car?" <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, and here's Woke Shaman. Katie, you're you so beautiful. You shine, woman. You're a queen. I am a super fan. Uh, cool. Yeah, he tunes in. I don't know who that is. I don't know if it's a he, she. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> cool. So, Katie, I'm at the end of my list here. That's all my shit. I want to first say thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing your story. I really appreciate your time and skinning that coyote with Tasha. <laughs> But if there's anything else or if you have any shameless plugs or shout outs you want to give, now's the time. Thanks again so much for doing this. Yeah. You know, I think I just want to close on just a little comedy for everybody. How in the interview when Devin was saying he's so terrified of me that I'm going to put him through like the pain and torture of what I've done. I don't know how he said it. Too terrified to see me again to have to relive all that I've put him through. And I don't know if anyone's seen me in person, but I'm not very intimidating. I'm a five foot, 110 pound little girl. And if a businessman can't take on this, <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of other scary people out there that he probably shouldn't be like lying to and fucking with because he's lucky it was just me. Like, I don't know. I mean, shout out to this channel because I'm like, Chandler, we got we got to like do something for Caleb like this. is, And it's incredible. Like, I think that you share a lot of really important information. And this is obviously not what you care to share, like the small town drama. But I mean, it just feels good for me to not go unnoticed. And what a big piece of my life that just is being brushed under the rug that they're just they piggybacked off me and it sucks how, how about this question are you done growing commercial cannabis right now yes i mean i think i'm more happy and content like with a home grow whatever that might look like i mean it's tainted my relationship with the plant right now and that's really sad for me so I'm doing other things, but I'll come back to the market one day as long as people don't fucking hate me for being a whistleblower. <laughs> like, I'll call people out on their shit. Like, hey, me too. Uh, Todd also says, "What are you doing now?" Oh, I think I'm gonna move out west and live the fly fishing dream. To be honest, sounds like the most fulfilling thing for me, and I'm sure the universe will treat me well. Scott Hanson says, move on. <laughs> Word up. Well, Katie, if you don't have anything else, I'm pulling myself back up and I'm going to sign this off. Yeah, it sounds good. I appreciate your time and you've devoted a lot of time into me and all that I had to say. And thank you for making me just feel heard at the end of the day. Mm, my pleasure. That's what I'm here <laughs> for.
Um, this is my guest, Katie Tilton, former lead grower at Clean Cannabis Company. I'm your host, Caleb Teske. And remember, the devil's in the details, and the details are in the fine print.